Tonight, a right royal reception for King Charles and Queen Camilla, warmly welcomed as they begin their historic Aussie tour. Brave workers turn the tables on armed robbers during a raid on a Craigieburn jewellery store. The Premier heckled while unveiling her plan to build high-rise apartment towers across suburban Melbourne. Firebugs torture Brunswick Gym with links to the criminal underworld for the second time in a week. Nine News exclusive, we reveal the new subsidies on the way to boost solar uptake for apartment dwellers. And the stars come out to play, adding a celebrity edge to the US election campaign. This is Melbourne's Nine News with Peter Hitchener. Good evening. The royal tour has begun with an adoring public getting its first glimpse of the King and Queen on Australian soil. Charles and Camilla attended a church service in Sydney before taking their time to greet the delighted crowd. Kate Creedon was there. Out the gates of Admiralty House with a wave, signalling the start of a full day. First stop... St Thomas's Anglican Church in North Sydney, a place of worship not chosen at random. The King's great-grandfather was here nearly 150 years ago. His uh, great-grandfather, as a teenager, laid the cornerstone in 1881. It was a Sunday mass amongst the masses. <laughs> Royal watchers came with their cameras to catch a glimpse, alongside a small but vocal group of protesters. A crime against humanity! Either way, they'd all have to wait for a closer look. The King and Queen's full attention on the youngest members of the congregation. The pews were packed for the 45-minute service officiated by the Archbishop of Sydney. Outside, hundreds waited patiently, some for hours. And when the royal couple finally emerged from the church, the faithful responded. The King instantly spotting his first polo coach, Sinclair Hill, and his wife Wendy. Well, his Prince Philip, his father, said to me, will you help the boy many years ago? And I said, of course I'll help the boy. And the boy's now King. So it was very nice that he came and kissed me and had quite a long chat with us. Charles and Camilla in no rush, taking their time to chat with delighted Aussies from near and far. I've actually come from Kirribilli, not too far. <laughs> Well, I've flown down from the Gold Coast. Jake Pryor from Scotch College in Adelaide was invited by the Queen herself. We got on a plane at 6am this morning. A shout out to Mrs Grave who asked me to wear my uniform. This is the first time the Australian public has been able to get up close with a king on home soil. And regardless of how you feel about the royals, you can't help getting caught up in the fanfare. Oh, I wasn't really a royalist as such before, but I really do think they are doing a great job and they're great people. So I suppose I am, aren't I? The, the time that they gave, the, the, the king and the queen, gave to the crowd, the fact that they stopped and they chatted, it, it was wonderful. Even the Archbishop wasn't immune to a few nerves with the VIP guests in the congregation. Yes, I made sure I said my prayers before anything else happened this morning. At North Sydney, Kate Creedon, Nine News. After a morning with the people, it was straight to business for the King. Charles was whisked away to speak at a celebration at the New South Wales Parliament. Ruth Wynne-Williams has more. His Majesty's second day in Australia and for the handful who chanced it, lining up outside the New South Wales State Parliament, <laughs> the King made the time. Very nice. He's very gentle with shaking hands. Um, very approachable. Yeah. Breaking script and formality, the impromptu moment that hoped for old enthusiasts and some new Australian fans. I just shook the hand of the king. He looked very chill. Business time on the first tour of a Commonwealth realm as king. A visit to the country's oldest parliament marking the bicentenary of the New South Wales Upper House. His Majesty representing the Queen here in 1974. Today, he could be himself. I, I came 50 years ago for the 150th. I never thought I'd get here. Welcome back. Australia. Hosted by New South Wales Governor Margaret Beasley. 
This is His Majesty setting the agenda, the first in a series of formal government events. This visit to strengthen Commonwealth ties. Known to write his own speeches, the King addressing a parliamentary gathering of 200 invited guests. I first came to Australia nearly, nearly 60 years ago, which is slightly worrying. <laughs> now nearly 76 years old and fighting cancer. In the spirit of marking the passage of time, it is my great pleasure to present a small gift to the Parliament. It, it is, in fact, an hourglass, a speech timer. Then a quick crown ride across the harbour to meet with Governor-General Sam Mostyn. Did you get some sleep? No. Also at Admiralty House, a second meeting with Governor Beasley, this time dressed to match. <laughs> Today was packed but short all over by early afternoon, so His Majesty can rest. But on his march awaited Australian return, His Royal Highness wasting no time on the ground. Welcome to Australia. So, so with the sands of time encouraging brevity, <laughs> it just remains for me to say what a great joy it is to come to Australia for the first time as sovereign and to renew a love of this country and its people, which I have cherished for so long. Ruth Wynne williams Nine News. And while the royals may never complain, never explain, Queen Camilla has actually apologised for skipping Melbourne this time while greeting some Victorians who made the trip north to see the royal couple. Sorry we couldn't get that this time. We were trying to get everybody. We didn't get this much time. The itinerary was scaled back when the King was diagnosed with cancer, so maybe Melbourne will be on the itinerary next time. To the day's other news now, and brave jewellery shop workers at Craigieburn have taken on armed robbers who targeted their store. Julia Passarelli tells us the bandits smashed display cabinets before stealing expensive items as terrified shoppers looked on. A brazen robbery inside a busy shopping centre. Scary, it's horrible. Like, whoever did it, done it on a Sunday where there is families here. This family-owned business targeted by two armed men who used metal poles to smash open cabinets and steal valuable jewellery worth thousands. Well, it's pretty disgusting that they feel as though that they can walk into a busy shopping centre on a Sunday morning and um, you know, cause panic and hate, you know, havoc to people who are just going about their normal business. The thieves were quick, in and out in 30 seconds. That guy looks like he just robbed someone. After a staff member chased them out with a ring sizing stick. They're a bit shaken up. Um, obviously, uh, one of them is also rather brave uh, in that he chased one of the offenders out. Shoppers at Craigieburn Central ran and hid inside other stores for safety while businesses shut their roller doors just after 11 this morning. There was just a bunch of crashing and people screaming and running. All I could think of was just trying to hide my daughter so that if anything happens, she'd be safe. The offenders escaped the scene in a getaway car which was laying in wait outside. Police are now looking for it. It's a dark coloured Mazda CX-5. There are four offenders in total, however only two of them have gone into the store. As for the business owners, they've also been left with a hefty damage bill, but are still hoping to open again tomorrow. Julia Passarelli, Nine News. Angry residents have heckled Premier Jacinta Allen, shouting shame as she arrived at Brighton to reveal her new grand plan for high-rise apartments in suburban hubs. As Mark Santo Martino explains, there are 50 locations all around train stations and tram stops. Shame, Premier, shame! Fearing apartments towering 20 storeys high, local MP James Newbury rallied residents in Brighton. You can't impose high-rise developments on communities without asking them. Together, they literally say, not in my backyard. There are plenty of other places where people can go if they want to live high-density living. There's not enough parking, the schools don't have enough space. It has to be discussed, yes, but not 20 storeys. Jacinta Allen disagreed, albeit from behind closed doors. They are demonstrating how we got here in the first place, why the status quo is not an option. Labor's plan is to build 300,000 homes within 800 metres of 50 transport hubs. The first 25 were announced today. Middle Brighton is 
one of four named along the Sandringham line. There are eight more along the Frankston-Pakenham lines, six including Hawthorne in Melbourne's Inner East, three along the Lilydale line, as well as Tottenham, West Footscray and Middle Footscray stations in the west. We recognise that every single centre is different and that engagement and consultation will be street by street, metre by metre. Under Premier Jacinta Allen, you get no voice and you get no choice. Opposition leader John Pesuto joining hundreds in Mooney Ponds. Thanks for coming today. Worried their council was losing control. You can't raise a family in a one-bedroom apartment. Putting them in these locations means we don't have to invest more in road widening, new schools in the urban fringe. It just really helps that infrastructure bottom line for the state. Daniel Andrews promised 800,000 homes over 10 years last September. Jacinta Allen then announced 2 million by 2050, but in the past 12 months, councils have approved just 51,000 houses, flats and townhouses for construction, Victoria's lowest result since 2013. We want to kind of bring this back to saying what's best for Melbourne and Victoria across the whole state, not just thinking about some vocal minorities. This is a long-term plan. This change is not going to happen overnight. The sky is not going to fall down. And Mark joins me now on the news desk. Mark, how can the government reach its target? Well, that is the multi-billion dollar question, Pete. The reality is that the cost of labour, materials, interest rates and land tax have all been going up and foreign investment has also been stifled by increased taxes too. Overcoming that is going to require some pretty radical change, but Jacinta Allen says she's up to the task and we won't have to wait long to find out what she's thinking. The Premier has promised more will be announced this week, tomorrow and on Tuesday to be specific looking at developers as they try to get them back on board and back investing, Pete. OK, thank you, Mark Santomartino. A Brunswick gym linked to the underworld's most wanted man, Sam Abdulrahim, has been firebombed again. It's the second time this week the building has been torched. Lana Murphy reports. They didn't quite knock out their target the first time, so this morning returned for round two. Brunswick boxing facility Power Gymnasium targeted by arsonists for the second time in five days. The firebug pulled up on Ligon Street before 5am and ignited a blaze in the stairwell that led to the upstairs gym. But it didn't get far. Witnesses called triple zero and firefighters had it under control in minutes. The corner of Glen Lyon Road once again swarming with detectives. The suspected reason? The gym's previous links with former Mongols bikey Sam Abdul Rahim. The gym was his training base for years, even after he survived multiple attempts on his life. The most notable in 2022, when he survived after being shot in the chest outside a funeral in Faulkner. It's understood there's a $1 million bounty on his head, and dozens of homes and businesses linked to him have been targeted in the past year. On Tuesday, the damage to Power Gym was far more severe after a stolen BMW ram raided the building and it was set alight. But it was an innocent family business a bike shop on the ground floor that was decimated by the flames. Oh. They lost hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of customised and NDIS funded bikes and don't know how they'll be able to operate as they rebuild. Just feel sorry for them and it's a loss that another business doesn't need. The owners of Cargo Cycles have revealed they were dealt another blow on Wednesday. Thieves broke into the burnt out store and stole what they could from the blackened shelves. Task Force Luna, the squad dedicated to fighting Victoria's tobacco turf war, is leading the investigation. But the Power Gym boss, who also lost his business to fire last year, maintains the facility is not associated with any underworld figures. Lana Murphy, Nine News. The man who allegedly struck a police officer and dragged him along the road has been arrested. Police located the man at Point Cook. He was taken into custody and has since been interviewed. It's alleged the 21-year-old hit a police vehicle and the constable in a stolen car before fleeing. The officer suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Australia's a world leader in rooftop solar, but for the three million Australians living in apartments, it's been out of reach until now. Nine News can reveal plans to get rooftop solar onto unit blocks with fresh subsidies. Political editor Charles Croucher. On Sydney's harbour, this old building is charting a new direction for cost saving, bringing rooftop solar to apartments. Australians living in apartments have been left behind the rooftop solar 
revolution. A new report from Solar Citizens tonight calling for government support assessing unit blocks for solar, electric vehicle charging and batteries. With apartments on average we're able to reduce energy costs by around about $38,000 so that's a real saving for people specifically when cost of living is such a huge issue. And the Goldsboro building proves it can be more. The installation of 391 panels turning a $44,000 a month power bill down to $7,300 a month, meaning the project's broken even in three years. The building has had an old, old, old hot water system. The cost savings is incredible. One prospect is increasing the requirements of new apartment buildings as cities expand up and out. An owner investor just wants to maximise their rental yield, so maybe they're not as interested. And advocates argue as bills go down, values go up. If I had my way, I think we'd have solar panels on every single roof of every single apartment building and, you know, every building in the whole of the city of Sydney. Australia is a world leader in rooftop solar uptake. Tonight, both major parties working on election plans to lower the initial cost. If we can do something that supports households to deal with the costs of the energy transition, of course, we're, we're considering all matters relating to that. Even with batteries, base power will be needed, likely through gas or nuclear. For the price of one nuclear reactor, you could actually put solar and batteries into all 84,000 apartment buildings across New South Wales. What we're asking the government to do is to provide subsidies to enable them to get access to cheap, clean solar, electric vehicle charging and behind the metre batteries. Charles Croucher, Nine News. Pete Stanaway's here now with a look ahead to sport. Hi Pete, thanks so much. Tonight, some sore heads in the Kieran Mar camp after a rich racing double. And for the new King of Caulfield, a fresh challenge might just await. He has received an invite to, to go to the Japan Cup, which, which we haven't discussed yet. Also coming up in sport, no joy for Aussie Jack as a veteran makes his mark on the island. Tim Zhu flattened in a world title beatdown. Another instalment of Melbourne's basketball derby. Can Phoenix finally break their duck? And how Big Ange got the Premier League rocking after five minutes of mayhem. And the Blues celebrate the arrival of a Beckham. I'll explain all coming up in sport, Pete. OK, thank you, Clint. When Nine News Melbourne returns, the Lord Mayor's ambitious plan to transform city rooftops as his rivals pull ahead in the polls. Also, what sparked a runway emergency involving an Air New Zealand flight? And Indonesia swears in a new president following his landslide victory. Six days to go and Melbourne's Lord Mayoral candidates are making a last-ditch pitch to win votes. While the campaign has turned into a race to revitalise the city, it seems voters are struggling to choose, with incumbent Nick Rees behind in the latest poll. Laura Turner reports. An election campaign in full bloom and it's a case of weeding through all the political promises. I want Melbourne to become the garden city. NFL on the MCG, yes. We'll bring an F1 parade right to the heart of the city. The current mayor, Nick Rees, reckons gardens in the sky, converting more rooftops to green spaces and providing more parks is essential. By investing uh, $3 million in rooftop garden incentives on top of $10 million we've already committed to an urban forest fund. Melbourne's best landscape design expert agrees. We have more parks. We're known for our green spaces and for our parks and gardens. You know, that'll bring more tourists, hopefully. Whereas former AFL star and mayoral hopeful Anthony Kutafides wants to showcase American football on the MCG. I think of the Super Bowl in America and that really does entice a lot of people. And uh, wouldn't it be great to get it here and see them play on the MCG? And the former Deputy Mayor says he'll capitalise on the Grand Prix to drive investment into the CBD. You'll see drivers, cars from all the different classes winding their way through the streets, finishing up at City Square. After months of campaigning, there's now less than a week until ballots are due in. Despite that... There are thousands of voters who still haven't made up their minds. A Herald Sun poll has revealed 32% of voters remain undecided. Around 18% said Aaron Wood would get their vote, followed by Nick Rees and then Anthony Koudafides. I mean, people are saying they can't have four more years of the same, so we're really buoyed by that. But these numbers have apparently done nothing to uproot rival campaigns. 
Look, I'm really focused on my positive plans for Melbourne. So for me, I'm not too concerned. Laura Turner, Nine News. And you can see the leading candidates as they face off in our special Nine News Lord Mayoral debate on Tuesday at 4pm. Passengers on the Air New Zealand flight at the centre of a security scare at Sydney Airport say they had no idea there was a threat until they saw it on the news. Mark Burrows reports Federal Police are now investigating the incident. The Air New Zealand flight from Wellington isolated at the end of the runway with 154 passengers on board. So we were just sitting on the tarmac for like an hour and then we were told there was a security incident at the airport. But then it seemed like kind of weird because we were like quarantined on the corner of the runway. Some passengers telling Radio NZ there had been a bomb threat. Certainly the view outside the window backed that up. We weren't feeling scared until we had a look at the Googled what was going on. <laughs> OK. And then saw all the ambulance and the police outside. So it was a little bit... That was the intimidating part. Dozens of ambulances and fire trucks raced to the scene and heavily armed tactical police took up positions. There was no cabin announcement. Some passengers found out they were at the centre of a security scare by watching live news reports on their phone. I said, oh my God, this is our flight. And this is why we're sitting on the runway, because it just said there was a security breach. After an hour, the plane moved closer to the terminal. As passengers were allowed to leave, their carry-on bags were given the once-over by sniffer dogs. While it had the hallmarks of a bomb threat, all federal police are saying is that they made a thorough search of the aircraft, the luggage and the passengers and that nothing suspicious was found. Air New Zealand has apologised for the inconvenience, saying the safety and security of passengers and crew is our utmost priority. A security threat, which at least demonstrated the readiness of emergency services. Mark Burrows, Nine News. An assassination attempt on the Israeli Prime Minister is being blamed on Hezbollah. The attack comes as new video shows how the Hamas leader moved his family into Gaza tunnels hours before the October 7 attacks. Here's Jessica Milward. Carrying belongings in bags, bottles of water, pillows, even a TV. This, Israel says, is Hamas leader Yahya Sinwar entering tunnels in Gaza, his children and wife in tow. The date? October 7, 2023, just hours before the attacks on Israel, he was the mastermind of. The IDF says the footage was found a few months ago, releasing it and these pictures showing where Sinwa hid underground in Gaza. In Khan Yunis in February, our troops found supplies meant for a long stay in Sinwar's underground hideout. He eventually came above ground, though, this new video showing his final moments. This was the first and last time he encountered Israeli soldiers. Hopes the death of the Hamas leader would trigger an ease of suffering in Gaza, now gone. More than 50 people killed on the Strip in multiple Israeli strikes, including at a school in Gaza City, where displaced people were living. Israeli aircraft dropped leaflets to Palestinians, showing a photo of Sinwar dead with the message, Hamas will no longer rule Gaza. A deadly day in Lebanon too, as Israel continues its war on Hezbollah, who is being blamed for an assassination attempt on Prime Minister Netanyahu. A drone launched towards his home in the coastal town of Caesarea. No one was injured. Netanyahu releasing a statement warning, the attempt by Iran's proxy Hezbollah to assassinate me and my wife today was a grave mistake. We're going to win this war. So will something deter you? No. But a supposed US intelligence leak may impact Israel's plans to retaliate against Iran. Highly classified documents detailing Israel's military preparations for a strike circulating online. America now investigating who had access to the Pentagon documents. In London, Jessica Millward, Nine News. At least seven people have been killed in a freak accident in the US state of Georgia. Crowds had been gathering on Sapello Island for a cultural festival when a ferry dock collapsed. At least 20 people were dropped into the water. Local authorities have no idea what led to the incident. Indonesia has a new president with Prabowo Subianto sworn in today. 
The 73-year-old swept the election, securing nearly 60% of the vote. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese was due to attend his inauguration ceremony, but had to cancel due to the royal visit. Mimi Beck is here now with the latest on our weather. Mimi, it's been another beautiful day, hasn't it? It has been, Pete, and it was similar to yesterday, though, with a grey and cloudy start, but that managed to clear, and we did see some blue skies. From a low of 13, the city reached 18. Light winds made it feel a little cooler, though, at times. The calmer conditions are due to this high in the bite, and that extends a ridge across the state. That'll move further east tomorrow, but you can see a low-pressure system moving Moving across from the west. It will bring some rain later in the week, but before that, there's more sun on the way, and I'll have those details later in the bulletin. Okay, thank you, Mimi. And coming up after the break, a man left for dead after a bloody stabbing brawl at a St Kilda home. Celebrities join the candidates on the campaign trail as the presidential race heats up. Plus, the Melbourne fashion icons helping disadvantaged people put their best foot forward. Nine News, brought to you by Hyundai. Have you tried it? Now you can. Melbourne's parking fine mess. In a major Nine News investigation, the photographic proof that thousands of drivers have been wrongly stung. The secret documents that will shatter your faith in the system. Have you been caught out? Nine News investigates, Monday at 6. A man has been stabbed and left for dead after a fight at a St Kilda house. The two men were inside a property on Burnett Street when things turned violent. One man was taken to hospital with serious injuries and police are looking for the second man who fled before they arrived. It's believed the two men are known to each other. Celebrities are out on the campaign trail. Both US presidential candidates are using star power to bolster their bids for the presidency. Wrestlers supporting Donald Trump and singers Lizzo and Usher turning out for Kamala Harris. Jonathan Kersley with this report. The icon, Usher. Democrats are ushering in the celebrities. We ready. We In battleground Georgia, Usher headlining for the party's biggest star. Let's vote for a future, ladies and gentlemen. I love you more, but I love Kamala Harris even more. In Detroit, Michigan... I got a feeling, can y'all hear me all right? <laughs> Lizzo was singing from the same song sheet. So if you ask me if America is ready for its first woman president, I only got one thing to say. It's about damn time! Hey Donald Trump muscling in with WWE choices. legends. You can go with President Trump, Kane and The Undertaker, or you can take Kamala Harris, Dave Batista, and Tim Walls. While billionaire Trump donor Elon Musk is trying to bribe voters in the seven key states. So every day between now and the election, we'll be awarding a million dollars starting tonight. The former president rallying in Pennsylvania, a state that could ultimately decide the election. Everything they touch turns to... <laughs> Polls consistently show this to be one of the tightest election races in modern American history, and it has some analysts looking back on one of the most controversial more than 20 years ago. When the Supreme Court put an end to recounts in Florida and the Bush-Gore election, 537 votes decided the race. Fully expect Trump to contest the results if he's behind. Democrats have not ruled out contesting results as well. I think the stakes are that high for both sides right now. And both say the future of the country is on the line. In the United States, Jonathan Kersley, Nine News. The death of his former One Direction bandmate has prompted singer Zayn Malik to postpone the US leg of his tour. Announcing the decision on social media, he described the loss of Liam Payne as heartbreaking and said the concerts will now go ahead in January. There's more evidence North Korean soldiers are gearing up to fight alongside Russia in its war against Ukraine. 
This video, released by the Ukrainian government, apparently shows the troops receiving uniforms and equipment in Russia's Far East. Multiple intelligence agencies report the soldiers are being trained to be sent to the front line. Melbourne Fashion Week is about to kick off. That's happening this week. And in 2024, the major event will be helping the disadvantaged. Joe Hall reports this year, shoes worn by the models will be donated to help people through the not-for-profit job group Ready Set. From the glamour of the trendy fashion runway to the everyday. These are the shoes that our clients absolutely love. For the second year, Midas has made the generous donation of around 250 pairs of shoes to Ready Set, an organisation that helps women get back on their feet. The people that come to us really, um, they, they face challenges in their lives and we support women who are, are, are survivors of domestic violence, people who have encountered um, substance abuse or issues with the law, mental health issues. It really runs the full gamut of, of barriers. If you look good, you're going to feel good, and it's all about having the right mindset and the confidence to step out there and make a positive change and impact in your life. Women like Emma Bushell, who needed help through a tough time. Being a single parent, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to make ends meet, so um, I was recommended to come in here and be um, treated by the women. And that she was. A little makeover package included two pairs of Midas shoes. I got a couple of suit jackets, a couple of pairs of slacks, um, a top, a couple of pairs of shoes and a handbag and some makeup. So it was great. This year's Fashion Week shoes are currently being prepped for the models at a warehouse in Docklands. A range of options for their new forever home, a ready set client. We've got a heap of beautiful slingbacks, loafers, sneakers, heels, so there's certainly a style for everyone. It's just incredible to be able to offer um, our beautiful women that come to us with a brand new pair of shoes that are in season and fashionable and it just really lifts their, their confidence enormously. Before the Midas partnership, individual stylists brought shoes to shows, the heels taped and then returned to a store. In either case, they're almost brand new. So in a week, more stock for the Ready Set Refuge. They're worn for a very short time on the runway. They get their moment in front of the cameras and then they're off to make someone else feel confident in their next steps for success. As soon as the shoes are hot off the feet of the runway models at Melbourne Fashion Week, they'll be headed for Ready Set, where they'll ensure the clients are dressed to impress and help deliver Ready Set's mission. We do much more than just give people um, clothes and shoes. Uh, we provide them with confidence, uh, dignity and hope, and I think that's really the key. Joe Hall, Nine News. Still ahead in the news, the reckless young hoon drivers turning city tunnels into underground speedways. Kilos of cocaine found hidden inside a refrigerated shipping container at an Aussie port facility, plus... Camberwell celebrates the Minogue sisters with a market sing-along. More than 30 kilograms of cocaine with a street value of $10 million has been found inside a refrigerated shipping container at Port Botany. Border Force wants anyone who recognises these symbols to come forward as they try to track down the syndicate responsible. They look like regular glasses, but thanks to a hidden camera, they're anything but. So-called smart glasses are fast gaining popularity, but there are calls for an outright ban at schools across the country. Experts warn the unassuming eyewear can double as a powerful surveillance tool. Speeding drivers are using a Sydney tunnel as their personal racetrack, horrifying road safety authorities. The hoons are posting their dangerous stunts to social media, boasting about their reckless behaviour. Eddie Meyer with more. It's the latest video from a culture that celebrates street racing. The creator claiming these are stunts by professional drivers in controlled conditions. Donuts on suburban streets in Western Sydney don't seem all that controlled. And here, even racing in a new motorway tunnel. Uh, 
crash in that environment is always going to be catastrophic for the people in that vehicle, but also for others who are travelling in the tunnel who are likely to be innocent victims. <laughs> Those small margins, those seconds of decision making and response time are totally taken away when you're travelling at that sort of high speed. And it seems even the tunnel's speed cameras are a joke to them. Another Mexican camera coming up. Oh. How do you know? You just know. <laughs> if you know, you know. Authorities warn there are other tunnel surveillance and detection systems, data they share with police, who say they specifically target dangerous and irresponsible road behaviour. Eddie Meyer, Nine News. Shoppers at a market in the Inner East were spinning around all morning at a special event celebrating the Minogue Sisters. Performers danced on stilts to some of their biggest hits while a Kylie impersonator turned heads. The Minogues, of course, grew up in Camberwell, a proud claim to fame for the locals. Clint Stadaway's back now with Sunday Sport. Couldn't get locomotion in there? <laughs> Not quite. Thanks, Pete. After the break, the inside plan to make Pride of Jenny a Cox Plate winner. The big money offer that's got the king of Caulfield chomping at the bit. How an Aussie celebration went horribly wrong on the island. And a hug from Dad after a Tim Zoo nightmare. Welcome back. It's been a wild 24 hours for trainer Kieran Maher and his team with parties in both Melbourne and also Sydney to celebrate the Caulfield Cup Everest double. Connections now weighing up a lucrative offer for Cup winner Duke DeCessa. Nathan Curry reports. Back from the beach after a Caulfield Cup win, it's not just the team behind Duke DeCessa recovering from the celebrations. Very hungry, he's taken a bit of a bite out of the, uh, the trainer's trophy. Assistant trainer Jack Turnbull was charged with handling media duties and the tough job of summing up what it's like to win a Caulfield Cup and an Everest on the same day. I mean, you, you don't think it could happen because you just... You can't see it happening, um, but the fact it did, yeah, it's, it's very much pinch yourself stuff. Winning jockey Harry Coffey has rightly taken a lot of the cup spotlight as he refuses to let cystic fibrosis get in the way of his career. When he goes in for his treatment, he, he calls it a, a grease and oil change, um, which sort of tops him up and uh, he's just a marvel. It's all about mindset and he always comes up top and... Um, yesterday was just uh, the epitome of that. The team is now weighing up what's next for Duke to Cessa and a trip overseas could be on the cards. He may go to the, the, the 2000, the old McKinnon, um, end of the spring carnival. He has received an invite to, to go to the Japan Cup, which, which we haven't discussed yet. Meanwhile, Pride of Jenny will likely travel to Melbourne on Wednesday ahead of Saturday's Cox Plate. Beaten by half a length in the King Charles Stakes, the stable isn't concerned. She has an amazing knack to, to find under pressure. Uh, and I'm sure if she had seen the winner coming, I'm, I'm sure she would have lifted again. So um, we were delighted with her performance. Nathan Curry, Nine News. To Phillip Island now, where Mark Marquez wound back the clock to take out today's Australian MotoGP. But as Trent Nice tells us, he suffered an almighty scare that almost cost him the race. It was possibly the worst start imaginable for Mark Marquez. It's lights out and we are racing in. Oh! In Phillip Island, huge wheel spin. Just look at the smoke that pours off that rear tyre. The six-time world champion slipping back to seventh place after a dramatic wheel spin on the start line. Although this 31-year-old wasn't giving up just yet. When do we start queuing up the Jaws music for Mark Marquez's charge back through this pack? From virtually nowhere, Marquez was back in the hunt. All the while, his competitors were slowly dropping off. Finally came the Spaniard's chance, and with just three laps to race around the island, it was all or nothing. Marquez is going to send in out the inside oh. and forces Martin to give way. He made it stick, holding on to win his fifth. Australian MotoGP title. I thought that uh, one time was impossible to catch Martin, but uh, super happy for the victory. Jack Miller improving from 16th to 11th in his home Grand Prix. We just couldn't win a trick this weekend, but I lose that way sometimes in racing. Uh, we'll be back next year and uh, hopefully we'll get that yummy singing around here. More success for the Aussies in the Moto2 category with Senna Aegis bagging his first ever podium. It's not been the easiest of seasons and to get my first podium today I'm actually a bit emotional, so I just can't believe it, honestly. And while everything went to plan on track for the Aussie, his celebration wasn't exactly to script. Way. On the wet grass he goes. Trent Nice, Nine News. 
Whoops. Oscar Piastri has a bit of work to do in the US with the Aussies' frustrations laid bare as he qualified fifth for tonight's race. Mercedes star George Russell was on track to set a good time before he crashed out. And a big moment off the road for George Russell. George Russell in the Mercedes finds the barrier. Piastri's teammate Lando Norris, he will start from pole, while earlier in the sprint race, Red Bull's Max Verstappen took out the win. AFLW News and Geelong has hurt Brisbane's top two chances with a shock 10-point victory at Cadinia Park. Michaela Bowen providing a big highlight for the Cats after almost going the wrong way. She confused herself, then she confused Bowen. Meanwhile, the biggest Windy Hill crowd since 1991 watched as the Bombers went down by 51 points to the Roos. And there could be a Beckham playing for Carlton one day. That's right, Zach Williams and wife Rachel choosing the name for their newborn son. Tim Zhu's boxing career is now at a crossroads after his team was forced to throw in the towel during tonight, uh, today's brutal world title fight. And that starts Sunday scoreboard. With Dad Costa ringside, the zoo camp arrived in Orlando full of hope, but this quickly turned into a horror show. Oh, down goes Sue! A one-sided beatdown, the Aussie knocked to the floor three times by Bakram Mertazaliev during a breathtaking second round. How is he still up, Tim Zoo? He's not now. There was simply no way back for the 29-year-old forced to throw it in. Zoo, as the town comes in, it is over, the unthinkable. Things didn't go to plan. Uh, the better man won tonight. No excuses right there. Ange Postacoglu has guided Tottenham back onto the winners list. Against West Ham, Spurs went a goal down before levelling things up before half time. Then, three goals in five minutes sent the local fans crazy. This is Son Young Min back in the team today. Back in the goals today. Meanwhile, Manchester United came back from a goal down to beat Brentford 2-1. But there was strife for Arsenal. The Gunners copping their first defeat of the season after a red card just 28 minutes in. Bournemouth running out 2-0 winners. A breakthrough victory for South East Melbourne Phoenix. Hurt. It's good! After sacking their coach, the Phoenix used the Melbourne throwdown to ignite their season, beating United by nine. For the well. first time this season, South East Melbourne are on the winners list. And Victoria Shield clash with New South Wales got off to a bright start. As Callaway pins back the ears, opens the shoulders and lifts it over long on for six. That was before Sean Abbott struck with a string of wickets. Nathan Lyon chiming in two as the home side battled past 200 in their first dig. That is Sunday Night Sport for you, Pete. OK, thank you, Clint. Great work. And it's time to check back now on the weather with Mimi. It's set to warm up, Mimi. It is, Pete. We've had a settled weekend after our wild storms and tomorrow we're set to see more sun as the temperature climbs. I'll have the full forecast next. Hello again. A grey morning cleared into a partly cloudy day with some sunshine to see out the weekend. From an overnight low of 13, the city reached 18 degrees, which is bang on the September average. Across the suburbs, minimums range from 8 to 13. Then when the sun showed itself, the daytime temperature climbed to the high teens in most spots. Avalon made it to 20 degrees. But southerly winds did make it feel a little cooler at times. It was a warm day across the north of the state. Mildura and Wodonga both reached 27 degrees, while the mercury hit the high teens in the southwest and Gippsland districts. The settled conditions are due to this high that is extending a ridge across the state, while the weather in Queensland is really heating up with temperatures in the mid-30s in some parts and spring storms are appearing. Tomorrow, the calm conditions will continue in Victoria as the high moves further east. And that means a beautiful day is on the way for Canberra. So it will be a warm welcome to the Royals there, a top of 24 degrees, a touch cooler in Sydney with the chance of a shower, while Brisbane is headed for 28 degrees. Mostly sunny in Adelaide, a top of 30. Perth is headed for 20, while down in Hobart, they can expect 22. Back home, it'll be a mostly sunny uh, through the northern parts of the state. The temperature is set to be well above average in the high 20s. The mercury does have some work to do for Horsham. They'll go from a low of 5 to a forecast top of 27. Then Mildura will go even higher to hit 30.
It will remain dry across the suburbs. Low cloud will make it seem quite grey in the morning before it clears to be a mostly sunny day. The maximums range from 22 to 26. Now Geelong can expect a mostly sunny day. From a low of 11, it should reach 23. It'll be slightly warmer here in the city, a top of 25 degrees. And Tuesday, we aren't seeing 30 anymore. It's been revised to 29, which is still very warm for this time of year. Then on Wednesday, the chance of showers returns, a top of 20. 17 degrees on Thursday, up to 3 millimetres of showers. A cooler start on Friday, a low of 9 and a top of 16. 19 on Saturday and a top of 23 next Sunday. From a low of 11, the city should reach 25 degrees. Cloud will clear for a beautiful afternoon. And a warning, the pollen count is quite high, so it could be tough for the hay fever sufferers. But it'll be a beautiful start to the week. OK, great. Thank you, Mimi. Now, before we go, here's Tara Brown with a quick look at this week's edition of 60 Minutes. Thanks, Pete. Tonight... I had no dissent. I had no people questioning you me. You sound like a despot. Yeah, I was a mullet. The world, according to Boris Johnson... Unvarnished, uncensored. The former British PM's sneaky role in AUKUS... No, 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 no. I was the midwife. ...and his secret plan to invade Z Holland. It was more of a Pink Panther operation, right? Plus, our special tribute to George Negus. Quintessential rock and roll star reporter. That's tonight after the block... Back to you, Pete. Thank you, Tara. And Melbourne, that's what's news this Sunday. Enjoy your evening and good night.